There are problems that affect so many, and yet so few talk about them. Which is why Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg and Moshe Yachnes bring you Out of the Shadows, a Jewish approach to mental health. Rabbi Goldberg and Moshe speak to leaders in the field and discuss contemporary challenges to help us better understand mental health and those who are struggling with it. This month's topic, trauma. On this episode, we are joined by Dr. Akiva Perlman, Clinical Director at ODA Wellness Institute and Professor at the Wurzweiler Graduate School of Social Work. And by Zeldi, an individual who bravely shares her experiences with trauma. We hope you find this episode meaningful and helpful. And be sure to check out the show notes for further resources. Next month, we will focus on OCD. If you have any thoughts, ideas, or suggestions for guests, please reach out to us at info at outoftheshadowspodcast.com. Welcome to Out of the Shadows, episode three. Moshe, great to be together again as we continue this journey of trying to remove the stigma and the shanda to encourage those with working towards mental health to come out of the shadows, to uh, to remove the negativity around it and, and to make people realize that all of us are struggling with something and to normalize these issues. It's always great to be together, Moshe. Yes, same here. It's uh, it's really good to be back. And the feedback continues to pour in regarding the normalization of real complex mental health issues. Uh, we get emails and calls all the time regarding uh, whether it's a comment on the, the actual show or in general, the fact that we're doing this type of, of you know podcast uh, is so empowering and it sheds real, real bright light on a, a really challenging issue uh, that we're facing on a macro level across the board within our community. Absolutely. And to know just, just how big and broad it is, uh, we get feedback after each episode so far. Not only thank you for addressing and validating this topic, here are other topics you really need to cover. So yes. there's so much to talk about. And tonight we're going to talk about trauma, which is a, a significant issue because there are people who know they went through a trauma. There are people who've either suppressed the trauma. There are people who haven't even defined what they experienced as a trauma, but it's lingering in the background and animating so much of their life. So Moshe, get us started by telling us what is trauma? How do you define trauma? People misuse that word trauma and they label some insignificant things as traumatic or I have PTSD from the last time the flight was delayed. Is that is that yeah. trauma? What is trauma? That's a great question. And obviously trauma is a broad topic. Um, you know, the way I conceptualize trauma is really to differentiate between trauma in the sense of an intense experience, whether it's combat or a car accident, or it's isolated to one event. Uh, and that can be life changing for many people. Um, they have nightmares and there is a physiological reaction to it. Um, they're replaying that episode over and over and that's traumatic. And it does require some real comprehensive work in order to navigate uh, the reactions. Uh, and then there's something a little bit more um, subtle. I would call it, it's more covert. Uh, it's uh, we, we, the, the therapy in the therapeutic community, we coin it uh, relational trauma or complex trauma. And that is something that is a little more subtle and really exists and develops over a, a sustained long period of time. Um, you know, something as uh, it, it talks to the core of a person's attachment. Um, as an example, um, you know, every, parents are, are, are well-intentioned and good-minded. And if a person comes home and they're on their cell phone um, and their child uh, is, is eking and, 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 and wanting, desiring their attention, and they're disconnected uh, because they're preoccupied by their cell phone. Um, it's something that is, again, not, nothing intense um, or nothing that is obviously aggressive or, or uh, malicious. However, a child starts to internalize hey, how come daddy is not connecting to me? Why is my spouse um, not, not, not focused on, on my needs? And that's something that we call, we refer to as relational trauma. And, and mm. a person starts to develop a, a mindset that they're, that they're not worth it. They, at their core self, they, they don't have the value. Um, they don't bring something to the table, metaphorically, that is deservant of, uh, you know, of attention and focus. Uh, abandonment is uh, another expression of trauma. Obviously, sexual abuse um, is an expression of trauma. Um, those are those are things that we refer to as complex trauma. Um, and obviously, there's a huge correlation between these types of trauma and addiction uh, because it affects a person's equilibrium. It affects their ability to modulate emotions. Um, they don't trust their core self. Um, they start to hide and that shame starts to develop uh, a block um, from, from their ability to interact with the world. 
And from my so, side, I can tell you, as, as, as a rabbi who's there supporting people who are going through conflict, whether it's um, helping, never independently, always referring to a to a therapist, but complementing it with support for shalom bias issues, marital issues, challenges with children, challenges with, with failure to launch or, or struggle with ambition at work. And often underlying it is there's some trauma that, that's not been addressed, that's not been unpacked, that's not been worked out. And, and you know, only recently uh, dealing with somebody who had lost a parent at a very young age and never really grieved or processed or understood that and it embedded in itself in such a way that now there was a struggle with relationships and forging meaningful relationships. And that's why this topic tonight is really, really important for people to have awareness within themselves, to know that there is ability to work on it and to recover from it and to lead a very healthy and a very happy life as long as it's something that there's no shame around that we're willing to, to be able to address it and support one another with it. And tonight, and you know, we're super excited to bring on Dr. Kiva Perlman as a professional who I have, I have deep respect. I know him probably close to 20 years at this point. We've worked together. Uh, he's phenomenal, has so much rich content to share and really has a, a really a, 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 an eye-opening macro level view of individuals in our community who have experienced real traumatic events, whether it's individual isolated trauma or this complex relational trauma that we discussed. So thank you for joining us. And together we can help bring this issue out of the shadows. Here we go. Dr. Perlman, thank you so much for joining us and uh, engaging us in this conversation out of the shadows, tackling what is a topic that's probably much broader and more pervasive than we even recognize. But for the people who struggle with it, they're well aware. And that's the topic of trauma. So I want to come out of the gate to ask you, how would you define trauma? How would you define PTSD. You know, we use these words very loosely and, and in some way, therefore, they lose their meaning or it's even insensitive to the people really struggling. But, you know, someone will say, I have such PTSD from the last time I went to Trader Joe's and they were out of my favorite potato chips. I have PTSD from the last time, uh, whatever, I was disappointed by such and such. So what is trauma? What is PTSD? How would you define it? What qualifies as and rises to that definition? Yeah. So first of all, thank you for having me. It's a great honor. And so deeply appreciate what both of you do for Call Yisrael and uh, for having me. It's, it's just wonderful to be here. Um, I think there are certain ideas that were new many, many years ago. And at the time, they were revolutionary. And then over time, we sort of settle into the concept. Um, and I think that when we're having this conversation right now, I think it's fair to say that we've settled into the trauma idea. And I think what often happens once you settle into something is that it sort of becomes a part of our everyday vernacular, our everyday understanding of things. Um, and we sort of lose the potency of what it is. I remember I had a student in grad school, I was teaching an addiction course, and they started talking about all these different types of addictions, like cigarettes and other things uh, that were like minor, they're problematic, but certainly minor relative to let's say heroin or things are more significant. And I remember sharing at the time that we don't want to take away from the honor, the respect, the suffering that people have had to sort of diminish and call everybody an addict with every behavior. And I think it's the same with trauma. Um, at this point, we're kind of like throwing the term out, you know, very loosely, um, as you described, um, where if it's about a, a game or something else, we're just throwing out the term. And I think we need to understand that first and foremost, trauma for someone who's struggling with it and living with it. It's more than just an event. And we'll get to PTSD in a second. It is an experience that shapes the essence of a person. So when we talk about trauma, the broad definition of it is that when you have an experience in your life that you're not yet ready to experience or to integrate into your life. So you're sort of flooded by something that your body, your mind, your spirit can't really integrate. And as a result of that, it kind of spills over. Um, and what it ultimately does, the effect of that is it shapes the way that you see the world. It shapes your lenses. A person who puts on glasses in the morning, they usually see clearer. But a person who's wearing glasses that are sort of shaped by trauma, they see the world through a very distorted set of lenses. Um, and the world, that's why often relationships are impacted, um, especially interpersonal ones and deeper ones, more connected ones. Work is often uh, impacted by it because the, the way that they see themselves the way they see their own reflection, the way they interact with others is profoundly shifted um, and changed as a result of what they went through, primarily because they couldn't integrate and make sense of the experience as they were having it. Um, PTSD is slightly different, if you don't mind, or most you want to jump in with something. Yeah, no, first of all, it's great to see you again. 
Um, it's been a long time. Uh, just as far as, you know, what you're expressing the, the, the lens in which uh, somebody who experienced trauma views the world, is that uh, emotional? Is that psychological? Is that phys- physical? Can you just elaborate a little bit around the different, I guess, consequences or long-term effects of those lenses? Yeah, well, it's, it really touches upon every area that you're describing. From a physiological level, we could look at brain scans of people who have not experienced trauma and what that looks like and how they process information versus people who've been through something that's been intense and extreme and, and overloading the way we're describing it now. Um, so on the brain itself, it transforms its structure and it, it certainly transforms the way that we process things, the way that we process information, ideas, um, for example, if I have a conversation with, with you, a wonderful person, I, we've had many conversations before, I, it's safe enough for me to say, I know how you're going to experience what I'm saying to you. But if I'm speaking with someone who's experienced something that has overloaded their system altogether, I'm not quite sure how they're going to internalize that reaction um, or what I'm saying to them. I could tell someone, uh, you know, ask someone a basic question of how is your day? I have a client, a particular client that I've been working with for around uh, close to two years now. And every time I meet with this, this, this person who suffered a great deal of trauma in their lives, I ask them, how are you? And they kind of smile at that. And they say, like, are we going to do this again? Like every single week, we're going to have that same conversation. And what it demonstrates to me is that they don't hear how are you the same way other people that we could generally predict um, hear that statement. It means something different to them. Um, it could be based on the person and what their experience has been. It could be a defensive posture. It could be one where they feel like they're being attacked or misunderstood or you're violating their space, whatever that might be. So we kind of start from the brain and it makes its way virtually through every other system that we have. Um, our emotions, our body, you know, there's a lot of work. We may, maybe we'll get into it. One of the more common treatment modalities today is somatic, somatic experiencing There are some other names for it as well, but it kind of speaks to the trauma that gets absorbed into one's body that doesn't even have a language. It is simply absorbed into one's essence, and we need to find a way to release it so it it no longer is dominating that person's body. So we're talking about back back to the basic about just just the definition of trauma, right? So someone who survives a a massive car accident or overcomes a debilitating illness or those are traumatic events. Somebody who was abused, God forbid, that that, that's trauma. But somebody who I don't know, got fired from their job, somebody who had dated long term and had hopes for that relationship and they broke up, they got dumped. Is that trauma? How how do we define trauma? Right. Somebody who twisted their ankle and, and couldn't run the marathon they'd been training for. Is that trauma? How, how do we do just a basic definition of trauma? Well, it, the problem is, and this is why we're kind of having a hard time answering this question, is that the term is so broadly used at this moment that we don't have the classic definition. And that's why I would like to focus primarily on what I would, what we would call severe trauma, savant, trauma that is pervasive, that is introduced to a person at a time where they can't integrate it. I put it sexual abuse into that discussion when you're experiencing sensations in your body that you can't make sense of, you can't understand it, you can't rationalize what's happening to you. That to me is uh, the true definition of trauma. A child who goes through um, a very messy divorce, where at that point in their life when it took place, they can't make sense of relationships, they can't make sense of um, what a marriage is like altogether, let alone it falling apart. Everything else that you're referring to really makes its way into the other category that we didn't touch upon yet, which is more PTSD, like a single isolated traumatic event that at times could take real form in a person's being um, and really could cause a great deal of chaos. But what we're speaking about today, or I hope to speak about today, is a more pervasive form of trauma that is that everybody would agree that this meets the definition of an experience that someone had that dramatically shaped the way that they experience and perceive the world. So let's talk about that. Sorry. So the, the last, the last follow up on that before we then pivot to, to what we want to be talking about is: Would you ever say, or would you recommend to parents to ever say, if a child's using the word trauma to describe an event which we don't think rises to that level, right? Like I studied really hard and it turns out I failed the test. It's trauma. Right. I underwent the trauma. Would we say, you know, my dear child? That was hard for you, and I'm here for you, and let's talk about it. And I know it was difficult, but
but it wasn't trauma. And let's not use that word. Or if a person describes their own experience, should we not deny them using that word? Right. I, I think it's complicated to correct people's way of relating to a concept. I'm not sure we need to do that, but I think there's there's possibly a way the essence of what you're saying, like the foundational idea, you want to build people's resilience. One of the things maybe we'll get into this, one of the things that we're seeing now, because it's so loosely used, the term, is that it's almost taking away people's resilience as opposed to contributing to it. So I think that's the point that you're touching upon, that when someone has a hard day, um, we don't want to put it in that category of something terrible happened to me and I don't have the ability to withstand it or fight it. And I think there's a way of correcting that without going at the actual word. Yeah. You know, we could talk about, yeah, you had a really hard day, um, but tomorrow's another day, you know, just to give and them that, that empowerment. Correct. We, we've spoken about, you know, in previous episodes, we've talked a little bit about the difference between mental health and mental illness. And while somebody can experience a challenging day at school or even an intense event, that doesn't necessarily give them the license, so to speak, to define themselves as a trauma survivor, um, because it does. It, it, it's a misdefinition, and it also it, it allows them to to not build a certain skill set of perseverance and, and and work ethic to process challenges that come throughout life. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to the people who've actually just suffered a, trauma. Just a quick vignette for a second. I just finished teaching a class, a course on trauma in grad school. I'm a, I teach there in, in Wurzweiler through Sarah Schneer, fabulous program. And we had to, they had to write a final paper on trauma. And the, everyone was asking this question, well, how do we define it? What is it about? And I said, listen, if you could give me a good argument that someone who has a paper cut, that's going to truly impact their life in a meaningful way, then give it your best shot. Let's let's go in that direction too. Who's who's who am I or who is anyone to say that we should take away someone's you know personal experiences? And I had a student who took me up on it, and she wrote this wonderful paper on the trauma of a paper cut, um, and it was it was fabulous. And she she provided a great argument for it. Obviously, she connected it to many other things, um, but I, but I think it speaks to this idea that the term is just so widely used, and we need to find a way to to truly when you sit with people who've suffered a great deal throughout their lives and you see people whose lives have been changed as a result of their experiences, and then you listen to others who are describing challenging events, but events that we all go through and they're using the same term. Like there's a part of me that like feels like when I, the other people are on my mind and I'm thinking about their shared experience, there's a part of me that feels like that doesn't feel quite right um, to put them all in the same category. But again, it's a term, a term is a term. And at this point, you know, 15 years ago in this profession, people were very rarely using the term trauma, um, especially the way they're using it today. Um, but today, because it's overused, it's extended itself to virtually every corner of our work. Um, so everything is loosely defined as trauma today. Uh, but, yeah. So coming back to real trauma and people who, who've suffered it and struggled it, how would they identify that within themselves? Maybe they, they haven't even given it a name or labeled it. So can they really then know how to manage it? How would they identify it within themselves? And, and even once they do, what are some of the techniques and, and mechanisms and treatments and how can that be managed rather than it manage you and the rest of your life? Right. Well, like we said, that trauma is going to impact the way that you experience the world around you. So Believe it or not, most people who have trauma need to be introduced to the fact that they have trauma. Um, I have had, I can't tell you many countless times, emotion, I'm sure you could relate to this, and Rabbi as well, I'm sure, because you sit and you talk to people who've been through a lot in their lives, where they're telling the most horrific story, but they're, they're relating it in a way as if they were, you know, giving you directions from point A to point B. Um, and you're listening to the story and your insides are like turning all over the place, they're turning upside down. And yet this person is describing it as if this is regular life. And, and in my over, overwhelming experience in working with trauma is that most people need to be introduced to the idea that what they went through was not quite okay. Because when you, whatever experiences we go through in life, uh, we do our best, like naturally, which I made us this way, that we naturally kind of diffuse that experience and try to make sense of it. Um, and I'm, I hope it's okay to share this, but one of the instant, one of the reactions that people have to being sexually abused in childhood at times, because their, their system is so overwhelmingly flooded 
by that experience is they try to make sense of it. They try to integrate it into their system. Some people, again, it's a minority of people, but some of those people reenact what happened to them to make sense of it. So they'll go out and do a similar type of thing with a, with a sibling, with a relative, with a classmate, whatever that might be. So we have a natural protective mechanism inside of us that attempts to neutralize whatever experiences we've been through. So most people who've been through trauma, before they're introduced to the idea that you, you had the original person inside of you, you were a certain way, and then you encountered something that changed that path. It changed the, the vantage point of your life. You can no longer experience the world through those fresh and original eyes that you, that you saw it through. Um, there are many terms for what I'm speaking about now, either the original child or, or the, uh, uh, the wounded child, whatever name we want to give to it. So often people need to be introduced to the fact that they've been suffering um, and then sort of work backwards and then say, okay, how do we, how do we make sense of what we've been through in our lives? Uh, and it's often introduced by either therapy or loved ones in a person's life, or they encounter a hardship that they didn't necessarily anticipate, and then it brings them in for some help. But, but the help that they're seeking very often is not directly geared towards what the actual problem is. You know, they'll talk about, I'm having a relationship problem or an intimacy problem. And then you dig a little bit, and then you realize there's a whole story here that this person has sought to like integrate into their system. Um, so they're not paying too much attention to it. Is that a clock a classic mechanism, coping mechanism, like that subconsciously you even deny you the trauma so that you can cope and get out of bed in the morning? A hundred percent. Yeah. There are many different ways to describe it. Every ideology has its own, you know, terminology to describe what that works. But yeah, Freud calls it a defense mechanism. Um, other pe humanists call it organismic valuing process, but it's this, this notion that we sort of diffuse the tension in order to survive. Doc, from, from your vast experience, you know, you mentioned that that's very often the first step is just to identify the traumatic experience and, and the reality that there's a person beneath that before that experience, independent from that experience, et cetera. What, what percentage of the work is that is just internalizing that message that I, I had a healthy, curious, innocent little boy, little girl within me. And the traumatic experience shaped who I think I am today. And just to, to be able to differentiate between the two parts of themselves, what percentage of the work is that? Um, and how critical is that towards really processing and working through these, these painful experiences? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a huge percentage. Um, I think just because essentially what you're saying and what we're speaking about now is we're reintroducing a person to a self that is often long gone. Uh, there's an innocence that has dissipated or disappeared over time. And we want, we want them to realize that trauma is not the end of one's life or the recognition or, or acknowledgement of trauma is not the end. It's often the beginning of a journey of, of rediscovering oneself. So the, the initial part of that work is just helping integrate them uh, to what was and what happened, the damage that it caused them, and also in doing so, you want them to feel it. You want to feel it emotionally. You want to feel it physiologically. You want to be with that part of you that was actually harmed. Um, and then from there, once you could clear up, if we could call it that, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a term I don't love, but because we don't, we don't move on from these things. We move forward with it. You know, people who've experienced this type of suffering in their lives, they often are some of the greatest people I know, some of the greatest change makers around. Because they, it's shaped the way that they see the world, not only in a negative way, but also in a positive way. Um, they have deeper sense of compassion once they go through this process and the desire to bring greater healing into the world. So that initial stage that we're talking about is a huge part of the work. And then by going through it successfully, you then have the ability to choose again. You then have the ability to decide which lenses do I want to put on in the morning. Um, are they my own or is it going to be determined by somebody else or an experience that I had that was largely against my will? Um, so it's a big part. If I had to put a number to it, I'd say probably close to 60 percent. Oh, good. OK. And the role of, of family as a person is maybe going through that process, uh, the role of a loved one, a partner, um, yeah. because it's it's going to be a new sense of self. Right. It's it's a redefined or or um, somebody who they might not realize they really are 
Um, what's the role of family or loved one, community members to help, you know, nurture that, that new identity, if you will? Yeah, I, I so appreciate that thought because it often gets overlooked. When you're living with someone, either be it a child or a spouse or a parent, who's like sort of going through this process, you have to expect a great deal of chaos. They're, it's not going to go smoothly. It's not going to be comfortable. They're encountering things that are largely new to them, feelings that are new, and they're on edge. I was sitting with a, with a woman just uh, earlier this week. Uh, it was a consultation. She came in to describe something, and she was describing, she said, I'm having such a hard time parenting my kids because I'm so wrapped up in work in relating to my own inner child. That was her language. She said, like, I feel like I, I she had six children, can I know? And she said, I feel like there's this seventh child that the voice is so loud inside of my mind that I don't seemingly have room to raise my other kids. Mm. And, and I think she's right. I think she's right. And, and the next step after that was bringing in her husband and saying, like, we need to, you know, elicit his compassion and understanding for what she's going through so he could learn to tolerate that, that very rocky road. So it's not a simple journey for a spouse to take alongside someone who's going through at least the early stages of treatment. Um, and you have to expect that, that the person's going to be a little bit different than you anticipated or from what you knew them to be prior. Um, and as a result of that, uh, you know, the relationship could get really, really exciting again. You know, Esther Perel, we're not talking about marriage now. She's a marriage writer. But Esther Perel always said when there's like a conflict in a marriage or something that severs that relationship. She turns to the couple and says, that relationship is over. Now, the question is, are you willing or, or do you have the desire to create a new relationship with the same person? And I think it's similar. It's like you're recreating something, learning a new set of rules. Um, now, often people who've been through a lot of trauma could either be one of the two extremes of emotionally cut off because they're having a hard time you know, accessing their emotions to being very emotionally volatile. Um, and they get accustomed to that. And now all of a sudden the person's going to shift and change and learn to regulate. And the question becomes, is that a person that you're now interested in again? Mm. Um, so it's you almost need to rechoose it, but there needs to be a lot of compassion for the family. Um, cause they're also you, going a really hard time. You said so many people, right? We established so many people, um, for whatever reason or however it's labeled, are in denial or suppress the fact that they went through a trauma so that they can band-aid and, and live life nonetheless. So, you know, for the people listening, maybe there are people listening who grew up children of divorce. Maybe there are people listening who were exposed to illness. Maybe there are people listening who were emotionally or physically abused, and yet they they have the resilience to have built a life and they feel like nothing's broken. Do I need to fix it? Would you suggest that even if someone didn't come in presenting some other challenge in life, be it parenting or intimacy or marriage, and then it was uncovered that there was trauma, but somebody now recognizes in themselves, you know, I didn't necessarily label it that way, but now that I think about my life, I, I endured a trauma. I wonder if I'd benefit from peeling off the layers and, and seeing what's there. If somebody didn't come in presenting an acute is issue where it was discovered it was trauma, would you still recommend that it's worth coming in to explore how much better your life could be and how much better you could be? It's a wonderful question. It's a, it's a challenging question because I, I'm not a believer in encouraging therapy. Therapy is a solution to a problem. That's often the way it's, I don't see therapy as, as like a completely harmless experience potentially. I think we all know that there are people who in the therapeutic process, like they encountered things that they were fearful of, of actually noticing. Um, and it caused them great distress as a result of that. Now, I don't, I don't fully believe that people who've experienced a lot in their lives in a very, in, in, a, in a challenging way, in the real trauma type of way, that they would be as you're describing. Um, people who've suffered, you know, Freud talks about this idea called psychic determinism, that, you know, when you get hit in the face with something, with a bat, you're going to get a bump, you're going to get a bruise. Um, and I think it's the same when it comes to like our emotional well-being. There are very few people that have really suffered a great deal that walk through that uh, unscathed. People get hurt by it. But if you're describing, let's say, let's say this theoretical person is doing really well and, and everything, thank God, is going wonderfully. I don't quite see a reason. There isn't a problem that they need to address in therapy. Therapy is a wonderful thing, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we all do it. I think there are plenty of people that do it to enhance their lives. 
but the overwhelming majority of people who go to therapy are those who are attempting to solve a problem. Um, and usually there's a problem. When you suffer, there's a problem. Yeah. Dr. Perlman, you know, one of the things that as a, I would say an agenda of this podcast is to help individuals um, come forth if they're struggling to come out of the shadows and to somehow chip away at the stigma you know, that's associated with mental health. Can you talk a little bit about some trends that you're seeing in the context of folks really working towards processing their trauma, trauma treatment, um, you know, modalities that are being used um, that are that are maybe facing communities or subsections of our community in general? Are we better off because of all the literature and because of, you know, things like this? Or, or were we better off you know, post-Holocaust years where people muscled through it and, and just found ways to build communities and families. What are you seeing on a macro level? Right. Well, I, I don't necessarily believe that we could compare like this generation to the post-Holocaust generation. They were doing what we were describing before. They were surviving. They couldn't necessarily look back. They needed to do what their system told them to do, which is move forward and rebuild. And, and thank, thankfully, they were able to do that. We're all benefiting from their sacrifice in doing so. Um, but there's no question in my mind that what we're seeing today in terms of treatments uh, community-wide are, are helping people a tremendous amount. Now, I'm not suggesting it's not disorienting at times. Um, there's been a lot of new programs that have made their way into our community, uh, some of them quite rapidly. You know, we have now tons and tons of intensive trauma programs that are short term, let's say five to five days, five to 10 days that are a very intense experience. You sort of go really far in, you encounter that inner child, you find a way to nurture that child. Um, and these things are sort of taking over the community by storm. I think, I don't know if we want to get into it, but, but certain communities have been largely attracted to the world of psychedelics, also as a form of, of trauma treatment, which again is also taking some communities by storm. Um, so I think we're all we're better off. But anytime you introduce something that's new, you're always going to go through a process of disorientation. Um, mm -hmm. the, the intentions are good. The, the outcomes are good. But when you take someone who has no, as we were describing before, like no real language with their inner world, um, they don't understand what's taking place on the inside. And you miraculously find a way to give them access to it really quickly. Usually in therapy, it's pretty slow. It's methodical. It takes time. And that's deliberate. You do it on purpose because it takes time to process it, to, to integrate those ideas. But some of these newer programs, they're like shocking people into, you know, this inner experience that is profound. And if you're not quite ready for it, it could really disorient a the person. There's no question. Um, you, have any, and, you have any sense on this, on the data and the statistics, right? Because uh, towards that agenda that Moshe um, eloquently articulated about removing the stigma, for people to be more sensitive to those around them, how pervasive is trauma in our community? In the average shul, the minion that you're sitting in, are you likely sitting next to, in the row of, just in the same room at somebody who went through trauma? What percentage of people of the community, however we want to define our community for this purpose, how, how pervasive is it? I would imagine, again, it's hard to get these numbers in the firm community. Um, I really appreciate, I forget which Rav it was recently at the Gouda conference who said, we need scientists. We need people to come in and really give us raw data on our community. And because we've been largely protected, a little bit isolated, uh, we tend to not have the same numbers. Um, but, but this is a question I've asked like all of my colleagues. I'd love to hear uh, Moshe, your answer to this. But I imagine it's somewhere around 20% of a community, one way or another, um, is sort of battling something. You know, the top areas of trauma being, you know, divorce and sexual abuse and and emotional neglect, things of that sort, I imagine 20% um, of the population, which again, we, we need to be sens sensitized to this reality because we're not speaking about like a tiny, tiny percentage. Yeah, it's re that's really important because it's not 0.02%. That means in a room with 10 people, two of them have suffered a trauma. So if two people in the room you know, didn't give you the good as quickly enough or didn't smile at you back or didn't seem friendly, just, just be kind to everyone. You never know who is 
facing what chronic challenge or, or confronting it and trying to be better. And I think that's true for in schools with our kids. It's true in, in shul and communal life for all of us. And if you're one of those two, don't feel that you're alone. You're not 0.02% of the population. There's someone else in that room of 10 that's going through what you're going through. Don't feel alone. Come out of the shadows. Get that help and realize, you know, it's not your fault. There shouldn't be a stigma around it. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's no... It doesn't hurt us to be wonderful to everyone around us, you know, to give them a smile, especially someone who doesn't know what a smile feels like. Yeah. How, how important is that, the smile, right? You, you were sharing even before we, we, we were talking on the episode about giving people the opportunity to tell their story, to experience warmth or affection. So what are yeah. some of those things that even without knowing some, maybe if we know, maybe we have a family member, extended family member, a friend or a colleague who we know is trying to work on some past traumatic event. What are the kind of things we could do to show them support? Yeah. Well, there's, I, I give a, a quick uh, story when I, I'm, let's say teaching about addiction. Um, I make sure to send everyone, all the students to, let's say a 12 step meeting or something like that, some type of meeting, a support network. And without fail, it's been, let's say 13, 14 years of teaching. And without fail, the end of that paper, I'd say 95% of the time, someone writes, um, I, I only wish that we had more of this in our community. Why do you have to be an addict in order to get to, to live in an environment where there's so much unconditional care and support and love for one another, where you could simply speak your mind? Why do you have to go to the opposite end of the earth to sort of return back to a place that is deeply compassionate? And I think it speaks to this idea that what if we created an environment that tolerated a person speaking their truth in a way that was, was honest and wholesome and possibly hurtful to hear? It's not so simple to listen to, to another person's suffering, but it's a wonderful opportunity to be present with such a person. And I think what, like many cases of suffering, we tend to stay away from it, even if we're familiar with it and we know it. Um, we store it somewhere and, and we rationalize to ourselves that they're probably uncomfortable having the conversation with us. Uh, in reality, uh, people often are, they really appreciate when they're followed up on by another person saying, I get that you're having a hard time. I'm here with you. I'm just thinking about you. I know I have a, uh, a tradition. I've worked with many addicts over the years. Most addicts, by the way, have a history of trauma, the overwhelming amount of them. And, um, and there are certain times of the year that are very challenging for an addict in the firm community. Going into Purim, going into Simchas Torah, these are just tough times for them. And I have like a list now, of probably close to 200 people that have accumulated over the years that I'll call on, you know, Arab Purim, saying like, I know this is a hard time. I'm thinking about you. And if you, you know, you're having a hard time, I'm right here. Give me a call. Um, and these are people that some of them I've just met along the way. Some I've worked with years ago. Um, again, this is my line of work, so I don't expect that from everybody else. Um, but at the same time, like it goes a really long way to let people know that they matter to you. Mm. So much of the, you know, in terms of trauma, processing trauma and addiction treatment at its core, you know, addiction is, is you know, a profound loneliness. And individuals, for whatever reason, have the, they were not capable of connecting or building or sustaining intimacy. And so much of the group model that is used in, in recovery programs or the 12 steps that you referenced, um, th those, those meetings is about creating safety and building intimacy one to the other. Um, and that's that just creating that environment as a platform for, for those individuals to come out, to share their story, to be heard uh, and to be confronted in a healthy way is so much part of the healing. It's a huge part, whether it's a traumatic um, you know, injury, so to speak, that, that caused the addiction, uh, complex trauma on an emotional level, anxiety, whatever the underworld of addiction is, so much of the treatment and so much of the recovery process is around that shared experience and the fellowship and the you know non-judgmental environment that but that is created in the rooms um, across programs, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah, and we'd, we'd all benefit from that. That's the truth. Yeah. But especially people who've been through so much. Like, because like, as you're describing, trauma creates a sense of isolation and loneliness. And when you sort of come, that person comes out and they could be embraced uh, in a meaningful way, the healing quality of that is just amazing. I remember I was speaking to an old timer in the rooms once and I asked him, I said, why is if anyone here has been to a 12 step meeting, there's a lot of touching, 
There's a lot of people hugging each other. And often they saw each other a day before at a different meeting. But then they saw them the following day and there's a huge hug all over again. And I asked the guy, I said, like, what is it all about? And he looked at me with these very wise eyes and he said, we're just making up for lost time, son. That's it. <laughs> and we're, 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 we're just making up for lost time. We didn't have this. And that's all he was saying. We didn't have this. We don't know this. And now we're giving it to ourselves as a gift. Um, and we could all do that for, for ourselves and, and, and one another and at every step of the way. You know, but right now, I'm working on Zoom, but I, I would love to hug this out at this moment. That would be a fabulous <laughs> We're given we're given a hug. You could send that energy even over technology. Dr. Promo, it's a great place to leave it. And we want to thank you for, for your time and your expertise and your contribution to this subject throughout the community and uh, teaching so many others. So thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you for having thank you. me. Thank you. We're joined now by Zeldi Broid. Zeldi, thank you so much for, for the courage to join us, to share a little bit of your story and the circumstances of trauma around your story, which we know is going to help so many people. And we're so grateful. Moshe, you recently had an experience uh, somebody shared yeah, with you. It's it's interesting, the timing. Just last week, um, I was speaking to somebody who is married in a relationship probably 15 or 18 years. They have grown children um, and they had a very challenging experience Um a traumatic experience when they were a kid that they suppressed for many, many years. And uh, they were going through a little bit of a challenge with their one of their children that triggered uh, this onslaught of emotion and almost paralyzed them from their ability to be productive. And I, I was telling them, just wait, just wait. There's going to be, you know, we're interviewing somebody. We're doing this discussion around trauma and how people can really navigate and, and move through it despite the deep pain and confusion. Um, so we're really excited and, and humbled um, for, you know, to hear your story and, and thank you for your courage and willingness to, to come on the show here and to, and to share. Thank you. Thank you, Moshe. We really just appreciate so much the opportunity and it means so much for me to be here. Um, I wanted to share a thought that I have been having as I get the opportunity to meet so many people and, you know, started to speak out a little bit more at different events and then when not. I feel like everyone has that one thing that they fear the most. I'm sure you can all think of that one thing that scares you. For me, and I'm sure for many other people, it was always public speaking, getting up, sharing my voice, sharing my opinions. I couldn't understand how people have the courage and confidence to do it. It was something that I always said I will never ever do. I'm not capable of getting up and speaking and sharing for other people to hear what's coming out of my mouth. And it's amazing for me to be able to reflect on it here as I sit with you and all those listening. And it showed me something so powerful. You know, what, what is the fear? What is it? The lack of confidence, feeling very small, inadequate. I mean, the list can go on. But, you know, I found through building up myself, figuring out who I am, and I'm continuing to do that, only then realizing that I had a strength in me that I was able to connect with others. And I found that strength that I never thought I even had. And literally the thing that I feared the most in the world ended up being something that was such a huge quality for me. And I don't think, not that I don't think, I actually, I know that I would have never been able to get to that point without having gone through what I did to get me to where I am today and to where I continue to strive to be. So it's, it's very, it's like especially meaningful to me that I'm actually sitting here with you all and talking and speaking. This is not something that, you know, it comes naturally to me, um, but it, it's, I'm, I'm very proud of it. And I like, it's, it's, it's amazing for me. So really, again, no, thank that's, you. A, that's an amazing it's, thought. It, it's a very amazing thought. It's very empowering to the people listening. And even in that little thought, how you've transformed the pain you've been through to recognize that it is, enabled you to be and empowered you to be, you know, who you are today. So you know that part of Out of the Shadows is to, to remove the stigma, the shanda, the shame surrounding these issues of mental health. And, and part of doing that is for people to realize that those who've gone through things are, are their neighbor, their friend, um, are, are somebody that they know. So let's start, tell us a little bit about, about yourself and then yes. to the degree that you're comfortable, a little bit about the story that brings you here today and, and where we are and where we're going. 100%. So yeah, I'm going to backtrack a little bit of time to a much earlier time, um, you know, when I think about, when I think about early childhood, a lot of happy memories come up for me. I come from a very big family. I love my blog, love the school. And, you know, the way, the way I think about it, it's very subjective to, to me. This is my own personal opinion. One thing that I'm always like clear is I'm not a clinician. I'm, I'm not wearing that hat. This is my own personal opinion on it. When it comes 
to the word trauma for a young child to really to be able to understand and comprehend what's going on around them can be very difficult. You know, these are people that we love and that we trust and the world is seemingly perfect. Everyone is good. Um, people are protecting us all the time. So for a young kid to experience trauma, but to not really be able to co comprehend and understand what is going on for them. Um, you know, as time goes on though, as one gets a little bit older, things can start coming up, but not really, you know, like I remember for myself, I'm like, we're, I'm like going back in that time where I wasn't even quite sure what are the things that I was feeling. I knew that something wasn't right. My body knew it. The whole nervous system will know it, but the mind can't fully grasp and understand really what's going on around them, how to even verbalize these feelings. You know, sometimes children, you'll see children will act out for whatever reason it is. It could be something very minute and small and then something a lot more bigger underlying. But for a child, a lot of times they're not going to be able to express and verbalize with words of what it is that they're feeling. And they'll mask that pain or they'll express the pain in some ways um, without actually being able to say the words. But they are crying out for help in some ways of just like someone take notice of me. Something's not okay. And I remember, I remember doing that. Like I have these like clear memories of certain experiences that I was going through as like a young kid in school in elementary that I was clearly not okay and clearly in pain, but just not knowing how to say it. Um, but when you look back and you take a look back in your life, you're like, okay, wow, like that was a clear sign out for pain. Um, you know, but when I think about like the next chapter as time went on a little bit, as I got a little older, thinking like in high school years, it got a little bit harder. There's one thing that I, there's one word that comes to my mind when it comes to high school years um, or early teen years. And that word is loneliness. I had such a hard time, you know, connecting with others, academics very much affected, really, really struggling to understand myself. But what is it that I was feeling? And just so desperately wanting to feel that safety, stability, and that security that I so lacked. Um, but having like no idea, like, you know, like when you start to like understand certain things, but you don't know why you're feeling these ways and is anyone else feeling it? Like, it was just like a world of loneliness. Like that's really the word that I, that I put in for, for those years. And I, you know, I, I remember like a very, a very vivid thought in, in my teenage years that as I started to really grasp certain things of just not knowing what to do with it and not really fully understanding what it is that I have really gone through and how to navigate it or what to do with it. Um, these are the two thoughts that stuck out for me. It's like, why, why would something that happened so long ago, right? This is something, a past experience. I was like presently seemingly okay, but something that happened so long ago, why would it be affecting me so strongly today? Like what in the world is wrong with me that something that happened, let's, like I lived in that mentality. It's like, this is what happened. And now you get up and you move on. It's like, why? why is something like it's it's not such a big deal you know those were the things that were like going through my mind at the time and another thing was just like who in the world could have gone through something similar am i the only one to others struggle in this way and those were the two thoughts that like i literally i'll never forget and and those are the things that just like stuck with me for a couple of years um, what'd you do with those thoughts did you did you address an adult is there someone that you trusted is there someone you could confide in to talk about this traumatic experience and how you were failed as a child and what that embedded in you as, as you were haunted by those thoughts, was there a, a, an address that you can channel them? I think at that time through those years, I didn't feel like either, either it was like a, like a worthy, like I didn't feel worthy enough to like be able to pick up the phone or talk to someone. I felt there was a lot of shame and stigma around, or not really even understanding or connecting dots so fully to really understand what it is I'm even trying to say. Or maybe feeling very scared. If I'm gonna like open up to someone, if I'm gonna say something, is someone going to minimize, you know, what it is that I went through or like, or like say that my pain wasn't valid. Like, I don't even know how to pinpoint it or what it is that held me back, but I lived with a lot of these feelings very silently for a long time, which, you know, it is terrible for somebody to have to live with such amount of, of pain and loneliness and silent. Like I'd say like the word silent suffering. Um, is, how, is, um, yeah. 
Yeah, how old were you at the time? Can you just give us a little bit of a window into your sure. age? You yeah. mentioned high school was post what? Yeah, I, I would say that like when when things got very rough and tough for me um, was really high school. I'd mm -hmm. say high school years. Um, I just I went to a large high school. I feel like I was just like one small little insignificant person. Um, I would say it was those years and post, you know, okay. and, and in my they, later teenage years. And the traumatic experiences took place prior to high school. Right. Exactly. And exactly. you were a child. You were you were a child. You were you know a person that didn't necessarily have the language or feel safe or even as appropriate to share any of these. these right. Or really not even understanding like what it is that I yeah. you know anything like that. Um, yeah. So it it was really it was really those years. And I know I remember I remember like another thought. You know, like those memories that you have that are so vivid, like you literally remember where you were at the time. I remember, you know, from Flatbush, walking down the streets on Avenue M and having a conversation with God. And this was not an angry one, right? We had many of those, but this was not like me coming at God and saying like, how could you do this to me? What did I ever do in this world? Like, it wasn't like that at all. I was having like a very, you know, heart to heart with God and like really reasoning with him. And I'm, I'm sharing this, I'm like talking. And it's, it's, I remember like always feeling like, embarrassed to even like verbalize what I'm about to share but like mm -hmm. through the work that we're doing today like I hear I hear this so often that other people have really felt this way and like I, I literally heard this recently from another member who put together a beautiful poem that so much spoke about what I'm about to share I remember you know walking down the streets and saying God like I'm not here to even question your ways right like we all have to go through different experiences in life we all have to go through the pain I'm not gonna even ask you why right we all I'm sure there is some grand reason um, but what I am going to ask you is if I had to experience that pain for whatever reason, I'm going to accept it. I'll take it. I remember having this thought so clearly, you know, you know, those memories that you have when they're so vivid, you like remember where you were when you had it. I remember having this conversation with God and I'm having this open heart to heart with him. And it wasn't coming from an angry place. It wasn't coming from this like hatred. Um, like, why did you give me what you did? It was more like, you know, Hashem, I'm gonna, let's have a conversation. Um, I'm not questioning your ways. I'm even gonna say, okay, we'll accept it. You know, everyone has their share in life, what they have to go through. But couldn't, couldn't I get something that I can pick up the phone, call someone, call an organization, have that family and the support, the friends and a school. And like, I just have people around me that I don't feel the stigma attached. I remember thinking like, you know, why am I thinking all these thoughts that I, I realize really today, looking back, like there are so many people that I've met who have really felt the same way of just feeling so, you know, alone in it and feeling this so much shame and stigma associated with something like sexual abuse. Um, and it was, it was really, you know, it was really, really tough for me. Um, you know, the pain from trauma can be so debilitating for someone not knowing who to turn to, who the right supports are. It can be so, so tough, but, but I will also say this today, and I can say it a lot more confidently today, you know, um, I think because I know what it feels like because of what that pain and the loneliness that I have gone through today, you know, it is my driving force into why I'm able to do what I do today and being able to create a whole network for those suffering from trauma um, of sexual abuse and, and that they don't have to suffer alone. What would you say, Zeldi? Thank you for that. I mean, it's a sounds like it was a powerful conversation with Hashem, and and so so many of us have those deep, honest, you know, conversations uh, that are pivotal moments in our lives. What would you say for those that are still struggling in silence, that uh, feel uh, incapable of of sharing or uh, un unsure how? What are some techniques you could perhaps give to our audience uh, if somebody's listening that had this experience, uh, this traumatic event uh, in their life? Sure. To anyone listening who had experienced, you know, a trauma or any real significant pain in your life, whatever it is, you know, this would be my message to you. You are not alone. There is one thing that is so important for you to remember. And I wish someone would have told this to me, by the way. Um, your trauma is something that happened to you and does not define you. It is not the essence of who you are. Sometimes you need to peel off those layers to find out, you know, the real you, but it is there. Trust the process. I'll often hear this from people asking me, 
how long do I need to be therapy in order for me to heal? When is the finish line? There's no, you know, to me, like there's no real answer for that for everyone. It's going to look different, but it's about not letting yourself get knocked down when you do have that step back or you're feeling depressed and you're feeling down to get back up and try as hard as you can to surround yourself with the supports, whatever it is out there. There are people who have gone through and are going through similar, not that it necessarily is going to help or make it, you know, feel hundred percent better, but it helps to know that whatever it is you're struggling, that you're not completely alone in it. And, you know, some other things that like I like to think about, um, you know, finding, finding ways to connect with others. I think it helps tremendously in the, in the healing process, finding the things that you can do for yourself to help you cope. Um, whatever that is, if it could be writing, drawing, exercise, and find the things that interest you um, and do things for yourself. And you'll teach yourself that you can give to yourself and you can love yourself. So, you know, that's something, a message that like, I wish someone would have told me back then while going through it. It's a lot easier said than done, to be mm -hmm. honest, to say all this, but but that's a message that I would really want to put out there to anyone so who's struggling in a big way. Zaldi, I'm curious. I'm sure the people listening are also. First of all, thank you for sharing that. Those those techniques and that advice, there are undoubtedly people listening right now who are in pain and think they're in pain alone and to know they're not alone is, is huge, which is really the point of our whole podcast. Out of the shadows, you're not alone. Come out of the shadows. Let's be together, a community. Let's support one another. What changed in you? You described that loneliness and that isolation, that solitude, that pain, that suffering and silence. You described that, that permeating so much of your childhood and your critical teenage years and something changed that you went for help and that you got some therapy and, and you got some support. And now look at you, you're in a position that you're providing that support to others. So what what's the switch that flipped? What changed? What created that moment that you were able to address it differently? Someone else might be able to find strength in that too. Sure. sure. I really love that question. You know, I think when I look back, I think for me, it was a very slow, gradual process. I didn't necessarily feel comfortable right away to share and disclose. I didn't right away believe that I'm going to be validated in the way that I needed, or anyone will be able to really fully understand what it is that I was going through. It happened slowly over time, going to therapy. That was, that was a big one. Um, understanding that I wasn't the only one who went through this and slowly while well, I began to peel those layers off and understand parts of myself better and the experience that I had also understanding why I reacted in certain ways and really learning to accept myself for it, you know, because that was the hard part. And I was ready and slowly over time, I would say I was ready to connect to others. And I actually remember really wanting to find someone that I could confide in, um, someone that who can be there for me while going through the journey. Like I, I definitely wanted that connection. And it wasn't as it wasn't necessarily so easy for me to find that as well right away and for me to be able to learn to trust and learn to let someone in. So that I, I would say it was a very slow, gradual process for me personally. Um, but I was so happy when I did. I mean, it was life changing for me once I started to talk to others, to open up. And I and I realized, you know, through that time that I had a, a power even connecting with others that like something sparked in me through everything that I wanted to be able to give back to others, which was, it was such a beautiful way in my own healing process while doing the work. And then once I got to a place where I was a lot more okay, I was a lot more ready to be able to open up and share. Um, and I was also able to give back to others. You know, so that, so that, was a that was a beautiful part of the journey. You've used your pain to help others, which is really extraordinary which is really extraordinary. Would you, every trauma is different. Uh, each, each person's experience and journey and pain is different. But, you know, if you could generalize, do you think that when a person has experienced trauma, do they need to go through the healing and the work and then they're okay? Or is this something that they need support and needs to be managed for the rest of their lives, but, but they can? Meaning, so, so just, just to understand your question fully. When they're going through, do you want to just rephrase that? I just want to understand. Right. When a person's experienced trauma, do they go for therapy and they now talk out and they resolve what they went through and now they're done, they're good, they're they're fixed for the rest of their life. And, and if you're listening, I put air quotes fixed as if they were broken. Um, or is it something that, no, that trauma has embedded some, some deep things that now for the rest of life may always be there lingering in the background, be aware of them, navigate them, you can manage them and they don't have to hold you back. Meaning for a person who underwent trauma, do they need to do the hard work and they're done? Or is it something that for the rest of life, 
be part of a support system and awareness and and uh, as you go sure. forward you know i remember i remember when someone came over to me and asked me you know if i'm gonna go ahead and do that trauma work i'm gonna go to therapy it doesn't mean like in two years i'm never gonna have to think about all of this that i went through i'm not gonna have these thoughts in my head i'm not gonna suffer this way and it was hard for me to answer that because you know like I, I think I think there are parts that are always going to, this is something that, it, like I said before, it doesn't define who you are. It's not the essence of who you are, but there may be parts of you that you're always going to carry, but it does not mean that you can lead a very happy, healthy, functional life um, and, you know, and, and move on in a way. So I, I definitely could say that with the right help and the right support and the right therapy doesn't mean you necessarily have to be in therapy for the rest of your life. I think for every person, it's going to look different, um, but not to ever think that this is something that has to stick with you and has to drag you down and weigh you down for the rest of your life. I, I really see such beauty and such you know powerful, amazing results in such resilient people who have gone through the worst and are, are doing well today. Um, and like I, I, I may have you know said this earlier, but I really love this analogy, of, and I, I often think about this. I often tell this to other people, that you know, like when with those boxes of being able to have the pain, right? We're, sometimes it's going to come up. There are certain things that are going to be triggering that are going to come up later on in life, and you don't even know like oh, why am I feeling this way? It could be from like an earlier trigger, or uh, and then your life could be. Everything's going okay. You know, you're, you're, you're going through the motions, you're happy, you're functioning, you're moving on. And then sometimes things will come up, but it doesn't, it's not a contradiction. Like it's okay to, to have that happiness, have that fulfillment, but also at times, you know, have that pain and sadness come up. And it, it's, and that's something that like, forgive yourself for it. It's okay to have that also. And it's, you know, you can have both. So yeah. There's actually a, there's a clinical modality called IFS where it's, it's parts work uh, to give an individual basic techniques to be able to differentiate between sometimes polarizing emotions or, or conflicting thoughts uh, within the same human being, within the same um, you know, experiences that they're seeing or triggers that they're having. Um, so if you could talk a little bit to those of us that um, listen and hear for perhaps the first time, a child or a friend that shared with us that they were that they experienced a the trauma, whether it's a you know if they are a victim of sexual abuse or any significant trauma traumatic experience. What what are some do's and don'ts um, for the first time here? The person who who are li is listening to the very first time, somebody disclosing and taking that risk. Um, for those of us who are parents of a young child or a friend or a spouse, what are some things that we can we can learn from from you that can be helpful to those that will hopefully share and 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 guide them to, to, to strength and, and to recovery. Sure. Sure. You know, when you, when you find that person, you know, that offers that unconditional love and acceptance, no judgment, and it, may, it makes all the difference. It is, mm -hmm. it's crucial. It's really crucial, especially when someone can already be judging themselves, not accepting themselves. Um, you know, sometimes it, it'll be a, a family member. Sometimes it's that distant relative, a friend, a rabbi, whatever it is. It's important to be able to develop that trust, which can take time to build, especially when coming, you know, and sharing and, and confiding can already be so vulnerable. Um, you know, when I when I take a, a look back to, and when I reflect on myself to see how everything folded, where it led me, and you know, the, where it took me to today, I'm I'm so grateful. Um, but I could say that you know, for myself, like I had a mixture of those responses. I had those people that you and I shared or disclosed or whatever it was, it was, it was so validating and it was exactly what I needed. And then there's those, you know, responses that definitely, definitely hurt. Um, and you should know when it comes to this topic, and it's a much bigger topic, you know, but the response that a person can have when someone does confide, however that's going to happen, however it's going to come to light, it is so crucial to that person's recovery and healing process to be believed in, to feel accepted to feel like no matter what they went through, they're gonna have people there for them. And oftentimes, by the way, I mean, people are not getting those responses that they, they're looking for and that they deserve. And that part can be so, so painful and traumatic in itself. Yeah, we've seen that, I mean, from the, the therapist chair, if you will, uh, where very often yeah. it's the first time somebody is disclosing or sharing. And, and you know, what you talked about is just that unconditional positive regard 
and acceptance is so fundamental. Um, and also just to be mindful for people um, that very often it's an opportunity to validate and embrace and encourage the person to continue to his goals, or also it can be re-traumatizing. If a person yeah. gets shut down, yeah. that's such a powerful opportunity. And yet it's a, it's a, it's a tricky road because for, if the person that reads that you're not uh, uh, trusting them or that for whatever reason you're doubting their story, it can re-traumatize them. And then it could bring them back to that dark hole. So it's a, it's an opportunity and yet it's a delicate one. Uh, with for for hearing that for the first time, you know. One yeah, of the you know, I, I, sorry. I've I've just reflected back. People have shared that you know it's it's just to say thank you for sharing that, and and I appreciate that. You know, if you're a loss of words and don't really know where to go with it, uh, somebody discloses to you, just you know recognize that that the person was courageous enough to share it. It's so validating, and it, and it is courageous of them, and it takes them sometimes years. Um, and if you're that person that's hearing it for the first time just to reinforce it, saying thank you. I appreciate you trusting me with this secret of yours. That in its own right is so empowering for the person. A hundred percent. I actually, I remember talking to this young woman who told me that after she shared with, I, I forgot who she told me, either a close family friend or a family member. And when she got like, just the whole conversation went so sour and so just, you know, shoved under the rug um, and, and nothing was done. She said that in itself was worse than everything that she had gone through, the aftermath of like finally getting the courage to be able to open up and share and not having the response that she was looking for was, was the worst thing for her. And that really stuck with her. And that's why this this podcast is so important and your courage to, to participate in it because the truth is people are well-meaning and they're well-intentioned and they're not educated on these issues. Really, almost for all of history until recently, we've not tackled and we've never validated these issues. And so person hears that, they might get inappropriate and ask inappropriate questions out of curiosity. They might, like you said, sweep it under the carpet. They don't know how to deal with it. They don't want to deal with it. Their life was much simpler before they knew what they just learned. And they don't want to know what they just learned about someone or about the either the perpetrator or the victim. And so I'm not defending the behavior, but that's why it's so important to, to educate and uh, to inform people and to open them up to the fact that there's likely someone in their life who's who's undergone a trauma and they may share it. And here are the kind of things to say that, that we've shared. So Zeldi, thank you so much for the courage to join us for all the work that you're doing to share your story. We wish you only continued strength and success in, in your amazing, healthy life that you've taken your pain and you're using it to support and help other people. That in itself is incredibly inspirational. Thank you so much for joining us on, on Out of the Shadows. Thank you. Thank you. Any thank final you. thoughts, Zeldi, before we let her go, Rabbi? Any, any, sure. any last comments that you want to share with, with people? Yes, 100%. I, first of all, I just want to highlight this as we close out, something that I feel so privileged to get to witness. You know, we started an organization for men and women who had experienced sexual abuse, and it's it's so amazing for me to see. And I just want to share this with you, and I often share this with the members of our organization. Um, you know, these women and men who are calling the organization because they are desperate for that support. And they're coming into the organization, they're coming into all the groups that we have, and what's amazing for me to be able to see as an objective view and to be able to really witness is what they end up doing for each other. And these men and women are coming and they really are not in always the, the greatest place right now in their life. And they're really feeling alone. But what happens is when they come into these groups, they, they came in to receive the support, but now they became the givers. And it's amazing. It's, it's just so beautiful for me to be able to see and to watch. And it's often, you know, the ones who, who sometimes have to fall the lowest and feel feel in such low places who end up reaching such great heights. And it's a true honor for me to get to know so many amazing people who are fighting, conquering and achieving such greatness. And, and I just really wanna thank you all for being able to give me the platform to be able to share a little bit of myself. It's not necessarily so easy for me, even me to do, but I know that if I could even help one person out there, it is so well worth it. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Zaldi. Wishing you all the best. Thank you so much. Moshe, another great episode, great conversations. I know I learned a Fantastic. lot and I'm very enriched by it. Um, my yeah. takeaway, and this is a theme that's been coming out now for three episodes, is the importance of helping people not feel alone. So much of, of 
mental illness and mental health struggles have to do with experiencing alone, feeling alone, feeling ashamed. And so for all of us as a community, as individuals, as family members, to be ready, be prepared, be prepared to listen without judgment, be prepared to love and accept people, be prepared to follow up and check in, be prepared to be able for people to confide and unburden themselves in us. If we create an environment, a culture, a community of better listening and of better connection, then we can help people really come out of the shadows, tackle their demons, so to say, lead much healthier lives. We'll all be much healthier together. That's something I learned tonight. 100%. And, you know, we say share it, don't fear it. Um, and that's really, the you know, at the core of navigating and processing any behavioral health challenge. Um, you know, we see it on, on a communal level, both um, both episodes regarding anxiety and trauma, we talked a little bit about uh, forming groups and the power of the group and the power of, um, you know, alleviating the shame through processing it and sharing with other people, whether that's in a structured way or in a private way, you know, speaking to somebody during the Kiddush um, at shul or having a conversation with a spouse or a child, uh, facilitating an environment of non-judgmental, sincere listening, active listening to helping that individual share the pain that they've experienced and through that can help guide them to continuing to share it and process it, whether it's through a professional uh, you know, lens or it's uh, through a peer support model. Um, we, we see that so often on, uh, you know, on, on, a, on more of a structured environment and, and through a treatment center um, and, or a therapist's office or a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a Rav, uh, but even as, as, as friends and as community members to be able to create an environment uh, for people to share safety is so critical uh, to Absolutely. help people navigate that. And the more we talk about it, uh, the more people will be encouraged and inspired to take that risk and to share. So, Absolutely. So uh, if you've undergone amazing. a trauma or if you know someone in your life who has and you'd like to learn more about it, you can see the resources in the show notes. We will continue to welcome your feedback and uh, we have the details how in the show notes as well. Thank you for joining us. We're looking forward to the next episode to continue yes. the conversations tackling mental health so all of us can bring this topic out of the shadows. Thank you all. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Out of the Shadows. To help bring the show to a wider audience, please rate and review on Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe and find more episodes of Out of the Shadows on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. For further resources, be sure to check out the show notes.